today we're gonna, I'm going to spend some time discussing the presentation of and diagnostic criteria for the two most common gluten-related disorders, which are celiac disease and non-celiac gluten sensitivity. Um, we're going to review the management of these two conditions together. And then along the way, we're going to highlight some hot topics, um, such as should we all go gluten-free? Um, are the prevalence of gluten-related disorders really rising? And has gluten become more toxic? I'm also going to highlight a little bit of research that's going on here at Mass General at the end, and we've saved time for questions. So before we really get started, we always want to make sure that nobody leaves our talk without knowing what gluten is, so you don't get embarrassed on the street. So, and so you know. But gluten is a protein found in wheat, rye, and barley. It's actually um, a protein that's a, a composite protein, so it's made up of gliadin and glutenin. And when we think about celiac disease, we're really focused on the gliadin protein. And that's because we know that it is the trigger of inflammation in celiac disease. It is resistant to complete digestion by all humans. And so for that reason, there's been a lot of research into this protein, um, including some done here at Mass General. And we've identified that there are certain peptides or linkages of amino acids in this protein that stimulate the immune system. So some of these peptides cause cell death. Others lead to sort of a release of inflammatory cytokines. And others lead to an increase in intestinal permeability. So this protein has a lot of really unique and interesting properties to study. So now that we know what gluten is, let's talk about the gluten-related disorders. So we know that there are lots of people on a gluten-free diet, um, and some of those don't have a medical necessity, and some do. And we're going to focus on those that require a gluten-free diet for medical necessity right now. Um, and those include patients with wheat allergy, which I really won't talk about today, but that is an IgE-based allergy to wheat, meaning patients that have this sort of have a typical IgE-based allergy response to wheat, which means <coughs> if they ingest wheat, they might have <coughs> lip swelling, throat swelling, difficulty breathing, what we call anaphylaxis. So we're not going to focus on that, but we're going to focus on celiac disease, which is an autoimmune disease, and non-celiac gluten sensitivity, which is a disease that we're still learning about, um, and we don't understand the pathophysiology just yet, but we do have some appreciation for how to diagnose it. So celiac disease is a chronic, lifelong, inflammatory autoimmune disorder in genetically predisposed individuals caused by the ingestion of gluten-containing grains, which we know are wheat, rye, and barley. The ingestion of these grains leads to an inappropriate immune response that ultimately leads to small intestinal damage. And that results in gastrointestinal complaints, nutrient malabsorption like low vitamin D or iron deficiency anemia, and some other symptoms that are outside the intestinal tract like fatigue, headache, joint pain, and other things. Celiac disease is a very unique model of autoimmune disease because we know a lot more about it than we do the other autoimmune diseases, like type 1 diabetes or multiple sclerosis. So in celiac disease, we know the trigger. We know that the ingestion of gluten turns on the autoimmune process, and when we take gluten out of the diet, the autoimmune process turns off. So again, we don't know that for things like inflammatory bowel disease or type 1 diabetes. Patients with celiac disease also, about 99.9% .9 of them must carry certain genetics, and those are called HLA DQ2 and DQ8. Um, and those are actively involved in the pathogenesis of celiac disease, so those are absolutely needed. And then we know that gluten has to get from inside the gastrointestinal tract, where we have ingested it, to the outside, which is called the lamina propria, or to the outside in the small intestinal tissue where it can interact with the immune system. So I'm not going to go through this whole thing, but um, as I said before, we know that no one can completely digest gluten, and so we have gliadin and glutenin molecules that sort of sit here, and they're able to interact with the what we call epithelial cell layer, or the single layer of cells that lines the small intestine. In all individuals, gl gliadin, when it interacts with this, oops, 
anyway, um, when, it, when gliadin interacts with the small intestinal layer of epithelial cells, it interacts with a protein called zonulin. That leads to a release of zonulin, which leads to an increase in gut permeability, or what some people say, leaky gut. That means the single layer of cells that line the small intestine, there's more space between them. And then gluten, or gliadin in particular, can come through that single layer of cells, and that's where it interacts with the immune system. In patients with celiac disease that have these certain genetics, those genetics bind that gliadin perfectly, present it to the immune system, and then inflammatory chemicals are released, and ultimately damage to the small intestine occurs. So we understand a lot about the mechanism of celiac disease, and we know that no one can completely digest gluten. So for that reason, a lot of patients and people will ask, you know, should we all go gluten-free? If no one can digest gluten, and if gliadin leads to increased intestinal permeability, that doesn't sound good, so let's all cut gluten out. So it's true that we all can't digest it, and it's true that it will lead to what we think is the release of zonulin and an increase in intestinal permeability, um, but in most people, that's not an issue. The immune system sees the gluten or the gliadin and just cleans it out. Um, there are many things that can cause an increase in intestinal permeability, so things like NSAIDs, ibuprofen, alcohol. Anytime we eat any food that has a microbe on it, the immune system, there's an increase in intestinal permeability that allows our immune system to see that microbe, mount an immune response, and then fight it. So while it's a normal physiologic process, it is also involved in the development of disease. So we have a lot more work to do to sort of understand the balance in intestinal permeability, but right now we would say don't go gluten-free to prevent increased intestinal permeability because there's so many other things that can lead to increased intestinal permeability. So just taking gluten out will not stop that. And it is a normal and healthy process much of the time. So celiac disease is a relatively <coughs> sort of newly um, recognized disease. The first patients treated for what we call celiac disease now, were in the late 1930s in the University of Maryland. Um, and what these children, these were children who presented with malabsorption, so belly pain, poor growth, um, and they were treated at that time with bananas. And if they did well, they were given a strict banana diet and sent home. So they were called the banana babies. And then about a decade later, um, a Dutch pediatrician, Dr. Dickey, noted that during World War II, he really wasn't seeing these patients anymore. And then once the war was over, again, these infants and young children um, with poor weight gain and nutritional defects were, again, coming into his office. And what he realized and later confirmed through a series of experiments was that um, wheat was not present during World War II. And then when it came back into the diet, he again started seeing these children. So he made that connection that wheat was involved in this malabsorption disease. So for many years we thought of celiac disease as sort of a primarily gastrointestinal disease that affected children between nine months and two years of age who presented with belly pain, constipation, abdominal distension, weight loss, um, and overall anorexia. But we now know that really celiac disease is a systemic autoimmune disease that can affect any tissue and organ in the body. And so patients may present with symptoms like rash or joint pain or um, anxiety or depression. They may have signs such as infertility, um, anemia, or elevated liver enzymes. So it really can affect all tissues and organs at this point. And so how did we get to from really thinking about this as a GI process to a systemic autoimmune disease? Well, one of the things that really helped was the development of accurate blood tests to screen for celiac disease. So prior to the late 90s or early 2000s, um, if someone was going to, if a doctor was concerned about celiac disease, they had to think about it, and then they had to perform an endoscopy. Um, that is the procedure that we still use today to confirm a diagnosis of celiac disease. 
But that endoscopy is, as you can see, sort of down to the right, is um, putting a tube down the, into the mouth, into the esophagus, through the stomach, and into the small intestine. You take tiny pieces of tissue. Um, so that second picture is what we see now on our very cool scopes when we're in the second portion of the small intestine, the duodenum. And then the last panel is what we see under the microscope. So on the top, you can see nor what we call normal healthy villi. So these long finger-like projections that lead to, um, that help us absorb nutrients. And below is a picture of flat villi. So in patients with celiac disease, we confirm the diagnosis by looking under the microscope and seeing either shortened or what we say blunted or flattened villi. So now, um, we can now sort of do these blood tests in the office and identify patients at risk for celiac disease. And so this led researchers like Dr. Fasano, who's in our celiac center, um, to do sort of large population studies. And these studies told us that not only is celiac disease quite frequent in the United States, so about one in 100 patients, but also that there are certain conditions that also have a higher risk of celiac disease. So patients with other autoimmune diseases like type 1 diabetes, autoimmune thyroid disease, and autoimmune liver disease have much higher frequencies of celiac disease. Um, patients with certain genetic syndromes like Down syndrome and Williams syndrome do as well. And finally, patients that have a first degree family member with celiac disease have a much higher um, frequency of celiac disease, somewhere between now what we think is 15 and depending on genetics, up to 26%. So the development of these screening tests and the ability to screen large populations also told us that um, unlike what we had believed for many, many years and decades, that, celiac, that you were born with celiac disease and whether you were diagnosed at age 10 or age 50 was just based on your symptoms and when someone sort of went looking for it, these studies allowed us to say that's not true and that you can actually develop celiac disease at any age. And we've only known that. We've only proven that since 2010, so this is relatively new as well. And that's from this study um, that, again, Dr. Fasano and other members out of our Mass General family were part of. Um, and what this study did was they looked at healthy blood donors at three different time points, separated by 15 years. And they measured the blood to see if those celiac um, antibodies were there. And they found that some patients that tested negative for celiac disease then tested positive. Sometimes they were in their fourth, fifth, or sixth decade. So this was the proof to say that there's something other than gluten and genetics that leads to the development of celiac disease. There's some unknown factor that turns it on, and it can do so really at any age. Okay. Um, this study also told us that the prevalence of celiac disease is rising, because when they looked at these same healthy, don healthy blood donors over a period of 35 years, what they found was that the prevalence of celiac disease was doubling every 15 years. So when this came out, people said this is probably due to our better testing techniques, more people know about celiac disease. But the truth is, this is happening with all autoimmune diseases. So whether you look at multiple sclerosis, Crohn's disease, type 1 diabetes, all autoimmune diseases are rising, and celiac disease is also um, sort of along with them. So now we're going to shift um, to speaking a little bit about non-celiac gluten sensitivity before Pam comes in and tells us all about the gluten-free diet. Um, so non-celiac gluten sensitivity is a term used for individuals in which gluten ingestion or ingestion of gluten-containing grains causes intestinal or extra-intestinal symptoms. Um, these symptoms are similar to those symptoms that people with celiac disease have. So the criteria to make this diagnosis is that wheat allergy and celiac disease must be ruled out, meaning somebody must be tested for celiac disease while they're eating gluten before we can say that they have non-celiac gluten sensitivity. So this condition is diagnosed by clinical symptoms as they occur in response to eating gluten. Because right now we have no objective diagnostic test, so we don't have a blood test that lets us know that someone might have it. We don't have the confirmatory biopsy where we can see changes under the microscope. We don't have any diagnostic test at this point 
that tells us other than saying how do you feel when you eat gluten versus how do you feel when you don't eat gluten. So there's a lot of work to be done because, because we don't have a biomarker or an objective test, we don't even know really exactly how many people might have this. So there's estimates between 5 and 30 percent. Um, I think our research has shown about 6 percent of the population may have non-celiac gluten sensitivity. We don't know if it's truly gluten that's causing the problem or if it's some other protein in wheat. Um, there are several researchers looking at what we call wheat amylase trypsin inhibitors, which are this, which is a certain protein that has been shown to sort of an increased over time um, in our wheat products. And again, there's no initial testing except to exclude celiac disease and wheat allergy. So the way we confirm the diagnosis of non-celiac gluten sensitivity at this point is saying, okay, you don't have celiac disease or wheat allergy, and then we ask a patient to eat gluten for a certain period of time and record their symptoms, we take the gluten out for a certain period of time and record their symptoms, and we go from there. So it's, it's difficult to identify biomarkers for this disease because there's so much unknown about it and because the symptoms really overlap with things like celiac disease, they have the same symptoms, wheat allergy, and irritable bowel syndrome. And so I just wanted to highlight from a recent multi-center study where they had patients who reported having non-celiac gluten sensitivity and they blinded them to what they were eating and they gave them rice powder at one for a couple of weeks and then um, gluten powder that contained gluten. And when they looked back and uncovered sort of the blind to the trial, only 14% of patients that reported non-celiac gluten sensitivity responded or had symptoms when they were exposed to gluten. So I put this there to say that it's going to be very difficult to find biomarkers because of the overlap with other um, diseases or possibly overlap with response to other foods. But also, you know, we don't know a lot about this just yet, and it's possible that it's transient. So for patients with non-celiac gluten sensitivity, we should consider, um, again, exposing them to gluten at different periods of time to see if they can possibly tolerate gluten again in the future. So to wrap up sort of the presentation and diagnosis of um, gluten-related disorders, we'll say that when we think about them, when we think about celiac disease, we tend to have patients that report sort of a slow onset of symptoms that might happen over weeks or years, whereas patients with non-celiac gluten sensitivity often have symptoms that are in direct response to eating gluten. Um, so that's one way where we can start to get a sense of whether which one it might be. Um, we understand the pathophysiology of celiac disease to an extent, and we know that it's an autoimmune disease. We think the immune system's involved in non-celiac gluten sensitivity, but we haven't come to an agreement on what exactly is going on. We, have, we suggest screening with a um, blood test first for patients that are at risk of having celiac disease or who have you know, any of the symptoms of celiac disease. Um, but with non-celiac gluten sensitivity, there is no blood test. Um, genetics are about 50% positive, you know. Um, we don't really have blood tests to help us there. And then we can confirm celiac disease with a small intestinal biopsy, but we don't have a confirmation test for non-celiac gluten sensitivity. So a lot of work to be done. <laughs>